Hello, my name is AJ and I have a channel on YouTube, which is my name, but it's also known as the Mighty Glue Stick because I started off doing crafting videos, as you do. Joining me today uh, to my side is Josiah. Would you like to tell us about your channel, Josiah? Sure. Uh, I'm Josiah, also known as Dungeon Dad. Uh, I have a YouTube channel, uh, all about D&D, specifically focused around D&D monsters. A lot of D&D monsters from previous editions of the game that you will not find in 5th edition. And we make stat blocks for them and stuff. Also, I have a D&D campaign running where my players are all toys. It's like Toy Story, but for adults. That's the pitch. <laughs> <laughs> And joining us today also is Jordan. Hello, Jordan. Uh, hello. Yes, uh, my name is Jordan with a silent PH in the middle. I have a YouTube channel uh, where uh, AJ and I are in a constant race to get to 100K. <laughs> and uh, it's it's all about lore and stuff, so it's fun. And also Wally. Hello, Wally. Hey, thanks for having me, AJ. Uh, I am Wally, also known as Wally DM. And fun fact, I also have a YouTube channel where I talk about puzzles and traps for Dungeons & Dragons. So we all have YouTube channels. It's crazy. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, the way that these roundtables work is that we have a bunch of questions. And in this particular instance where I'm hosting this chat, um, I've requested that each person contribute a question of their own. Mine, since I'm hosting, I'll start off, is what RPG other than Dungeons and Dragons do you convert the most monster and lore content over from into your D&D games? So... Who would like to start? Wally, would you like to start? Oh, absolutely. Because this is the fun fact about this question is I really haven't played a lot of different RPGs. And so I don't have experience with monsters from those. So I'm going to cheat just slightly. And starting to show off with a cheater, I know is not the best way to do it. But I'm going to actually say Magic the Gathering. Now, I know um. that there are already some MTG to D&D crossovers and stuff with Ravnica and Theros and things of that nature. But I have actually went and planned out even though i haven't got to use them yet but i wanted to introduce slivers into one of my future campaigns now if you're not familiar with slivers they're like this they're i, I don't know how to best describe maybe like this insectoid this uh this creature where they have a central hive mind and this hive mind is actually run by the sliver queen if you will and each one of them brings a different feature into the hive so if you encounter one sliver it could be like a strength sliver which is a, a muscle sliver from magic the gathering and it would provide maybe a, a bonus to an attack roll or a bonus to damage but now if you combine that muscle sliver with the armor sliver now the armor class of both of those are increased so the uh with the two together one, now they both have a better armor class and they both hit harder. And then you introduce a wing sliver. Now all three of them have flying. So I, I just thought it would be really fun. I haven't been able to fully flesh this out yet, but the poor souls that play one of my future campaigns are going to encounter slivers. They're just going to come from the Magic the Gathering world and we're going to have this entire hive mind. And I'm going to introduce them all one by one until the final battle when they'll all be right there and all gain the abilities. Do you think wow. it would be like a, a food thing? Like they have to eat one that has wings and then they all get wings or something? I don't know anything about slivers, but I just like that idea. Like we have to stop them from eating or something. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't I don't know if I'd go as that far as more of a shared brain, but now okay. that you think about it, I kind of like that idea. Because how of... do you share the the DNA to the yeah. other slivers so that they gain flying and stuff? I don't know. Maybe it's mm. something to do with the queen. Maybe they have like some yeah. the queen has some type of goodies or whatever. Maybe she has like a mom bag or something where she can pull things out I, and give each one. I always imagined it was very much like a if the hive consumes something that knows how to fly, then like the rest of them can slowly yeah. gain that ability. And like, like well, I guess Zerg are kind of like that or very like much alien so, franchise yeah. or something. I don't know. Well, it says here that bacteria actually exchange little chunks, little circles of their, uh, their DNA with each other sort of randomly. Hmm. So maybe the slivers could do something like that. CRISPR, man. <laughs> what does it say about the we need to invent a spell called CRISPR where you can, put like elf DNA into a human. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> that one's free, guys. 
<laughs> DMs Guild market that. You'll make millions. I can't wait. With that, uh, Jordan, what is uh, your contribution to this question? Shall, you know, I, shall I go over the question or no? No. Uh, okay. Well, yeah. So the question is what other game inspires monsters? Yeah. I, th I, I think, think we should open up the category to, to any sort of inspiration. Really. Oh, anything in inspiration. Okay. Because mm. I. Uh, that I mean, that was difficult because I'm like, there are so many monsters in 5e and even older editions of D&D that I would like look through and I'm like, oh, that's a cool monster. I'm going to like somehow build that in mine. Um, and a lot of times when I want monsters, I just flip through my kobold beast stuff and I'm mm. like, oh, I want to build an encounter around this thing. That's really cool. Um, but uh, a game that I am obsessed with that I have never played is uh, Monty Cook's Invisible Sun, which is just... I mean, again, I've never played it, so I don't know if it's actually fun to play, but like from a lore standpoint and a game creation world, it's amazing. And I use that to come up with interesting names for um, like boss monsters, if that makes sense. Like mm -hmm. uh, I, I just opened a PDF here quick and it's there's one there's a monster here called Collar of the Forest. And so it's like, OK, yeah, like I could find I, I don't necessarily have to use that, but I could find something based on that word that I use a lot. Um, there's another one in here called the uh, the Kyako, which is a hair-covered bird with a round body. It's flightless. It just runs around pecking at you. Um, there's lots of fun ones in here. So Invisible Sun definitely, overall, I feel, really influences a lot of my decision makings in D&D. &D. Um, but yeah, I'll also, so that, there's my answer. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> All right, Josiah, what's your uh, take on it? Um, my take on it was that I shamelessly rip off countless things from Numenera. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was like, did I just feel... I know this is going to be someone else's answer. Um, Numenera is sick. There are so many cool monsters in Numenera. Uh, we kind of talked about this in the, the episode from last uh, week or two weeks ago. I mentioned the Slittykin is a monster that I, I covered on my channel once, too, which are like these super grotesque uh, Numenera monsters. They have mouths all over their head and stuff. They're super gross. Um, but something really cool about Numenera is it's technically like sci-fi fantasy, but a lot of the sci-fi elements, if that doesn't fit in your setting, can be almost entirely analogous to magic, right? Like, the difference between a creature that has, is like, living in the old, uh, like, some old computer chip or something that can, like, can use these uh, technological abilities. You just replace that with, like, oh, it's runes and magic. Like, whatever. It's fine. Um, but the biggest thing that I think I stole from Numenera and am inspired by is the, just the world. Because it's called the Ninth World for a reason meaning that there are eight other civilizations that have come before the current age, which have all risen from like cavemen to the point where they're exploring the stars and stuff, and then eventually died out for one reason or another. So you're living in this kind of like weird medieval-esque timeline where there's like all this ancient technology buried in the ground that like no one really knows how to replicate. Um, and I think that's really cool. So even if you're not doing... Uh, a DD game that incorporates technology the idea of like worlds on top of worlds where like what societies came before the current age and what like ancient forgotten magic or uh different pieces of technology might be buried within is something that helps me a lot when it comes to world building um and numenera is largely to thank for that revelation mm. excellent as for my contribution, um, Warhammer 40k, I think, has inspired me the most for um, really sort of big concept stuff um, like the gene stealers and the, the, the entire idea of a intergalactic a life form that has traveled across the, the vast gulfs of space and is now just taking all biomatter from a world after world after world. And they, they seed these gene stealers forth to sort of uh, to stabilize any sort of opposition that they're going to encounter before they get there. And once the, the actual swarm starts to cloud around your planet, it's all over, you know, and and only the these absolutely bonkers, super strong uh, space heroes who descend from dropships from above, uh, like demigods raining from the sky and, 
impregnable armor and massive machine guns and things like that introducing that idea to your D D world is it's an entire campaign so um i like that sort of thing also i've used uh ratlings or rat folk or the the skaven from warhammer as uh basically where rats um run a lot of cities in my campaigns they're they're always you know messing with everything and they're always the shadowy force that you think is far more organized and uh and insidious than they really are in actual fact they're just you know they're like the teenage mutant ninja turtles and the sewers um <laughs> doing their thing so i also get inspired by really really old content such as um some of the unique monsters from choose your own adventure and just the different way that um in the early days because that's the guys that you know sort of started the hobby in, in many ways and other than that it's movies and i've got a book on mythology and things like that and and uh that I draw from occasionally as well, because a lot of different mythologies have some really weird monsters. And also, living in the Asia Pacific region as I do, um, the Japanese folklore is absolutely chock full of monsters. They're scared of everything, honestly. Like strange giant feet. That I it, there's some really weird monsters in Japan that um, can inspire you quite a lot. Um, and the Philippines has got like you know flying headless vampire things and yeah. you know that sort of stuff. It's great. Also, like a horse monster that's a bit like a kelpie that you uh, placate by giving it tobacco, things yeah. like that. Just yeah, I did a video on that once. I can't remember what it's called now, but it's like a mm. weird horse. It's a current. It's it. It answers the question which no one ever should have thought to ask, which is what if horses were carnivorous? Um, and the answer is just be glad they're not. I guess. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.